So we're going to cover a lot of material today, but we're going to try and kick it off with some high-level kind of concepts, and I'm hoping there'll be a few sort of fundamental ideas here that we'll hear echoed when we get to specifics later in the day. We'll be talking about particular software and particular hardware later, but uh, this is just kind of general ideas that uh, will apply to HPC I.O. So what do we mean by HPC I.O.? Just to start a baseline. So this is storing and retrieving data on your high performance computing platform. Uh, we're going to talk some about hardware, um, software components, and also how applications use them. So that's sort of the three pieces that are involved. Uh, data usually ends up being stored on a parallel file system. Uh, on, on the systems we have, this usually GPFS, an IBM file system, or Lustre, an Intel file system. And on the surface, they look like any other file system. You get files and directories just like you would have on your laptop or any other machine. But they've been optimized in some peculiar ways for a high volume parallel access. So it's intended for uh, lots of processes to access data at the same time. And we'll see kind of how it does that a little bit. So the hardware in a storage system includes the hard drives, uh, the enclosures for those hard drives, the servers, the network that connects you to them. Uh, the software, I mentioned the parallel file system already, but we have libraries that sit on top of that to help you use it. Um, and what we usually see in terms of why people are doing I.O., uh, of course there's the productive I.O., you want to save your results, um, the output of your simulations and so forth. There's also defensive I.O., if you're worried that your application or the machine might crash, you checkpoint periodically so you can restore. Um, and then increasingly we see more and more analysis I.O. on our systems where you have a big data set already and you're trying to mine uh, findings out of it. And uh, this is, you know, I.O. is a, a common you know, concern across a lot of fields when we kind of survey the system and see who's using it. Um, we see a huge variety of kind of scientific and engineering domains represented. Um, you know, this, is, uh, this graph is showing the top 10 producers and consumers for uh, uh, roughly a half year period on Mira a couple years ago. And uh, you know, the units that the largest producers are using is, are in the petabytes of data that they're moving on and off of the system. So that's the sort of scale that we're looking at. And the other interesting thing is that um, you know, sometimes we think about checkpoints as being the most important thing that happens or the most common thing that happens on the system. But Actually, a lot of these domains are reading a tremendous amount of data, too. So uh, reading and writing is important. depends on what you're doing. So what are some of the things that are unique about this environment? Um, we'll talk about that. And given those things that are unique, uh, what can you do to take advantage of it in your application? So the first thing, I'm just going to run through a set of five things that I think are kind of important takeaways to keep in mind when you're using these storage systems. Uh, the first is that on any of the uh, computing systems we're going to talk about, you have a lot of file systems to choose from. There's not just a file system. Um, I've got a, a chart here that I just cut and pasted from the NERSC website as an example because they have a pretty chart. But they have uh, six file systems to choose from. They have different characteristics, different capabilities. And so the first thing you want to do is make sure you're reading and writing your data from the place that makes the most sense for, uh, for what you're doing. Uh, if you're not sure, you can ask your support people at the site. They'll, they're more than happy to get you on the right storage system because bad things happen when you're not. Um, so to give an example of, of why this can be important, I'll look at uh, Mira. Um, so Mira has a home file system. When you log in, you do an LS, you see the files in your home directory. That home file system has 24 servers. Uh, it's connected to three big storage appliances. There's some extra replication there. Sounds like a huge file system, but if you compare it to the project file system, the biggest project file system, it has 128 servers, uh, has less replication, which means it's faster, um, and it has much more hard drives, much more storage appliances attached to it. So simply using that project file system instead of your home directory is going to get you at least six times the performance in theory, you know, depending on how you're using it. So uh, you, know, you want to be using the right right resources that you have at your disposal. Uh, the second thing is, because um, these file systems are so big, they're all uh, tens of petabytes at least at this point, um, it looks like a normal file system. You can use it like a laptop or, or a you know, regular, regular computer file system. 
but there's probably at least 10,000 hard drives back there. Um, and this means it's going to act differently than, than a conventional file system in a few ways. Uh, this diagram here is showing the, one of the larger file systems on the Cori system at NERSC. And what happens is uh, up here at the top, these are the compute nodes. These are called uh, LNAT router nodes that connect to the storage system. We have a big InfiniBand complex. We have uh, storage servers here, and then we have appliances you connect to, and then you can break this down even further to get to the individual disk drives. But what this means is when you say, I want to write a byte of data from a compute node to a disk, it's bouncing through a lot of places to get where it wants to go. Um, this isn't like talking to a, a hard drive that's right connected to your, uh, your machine. Um, it's traversing quite a ways. And the impact is that um, the latency is actually pretty bad. Um, the amount of time it takes to write one byte and wait for that byte to, um, to be written is, is a while. It's not, it's not what this file system is good at. So what is it good at is that you have a whole lot of these routes um, that can all be used at the same time. Uh, there's a lot of bandwidth on it. So what the file system is great at is aggregate bandwidth. So if you're doing big writes from a lot of processes at the same time, the file system can take it. Um, so the thing you'll hear over and over today is, is uh, optimizations that are geared towards getting you in this mode, doing what the file system is good at and not what it's bad at. So that generally means trying to move things in parallel, use big operations, uh, try to avoid doing little things and having your whole application wait for these little things to complete. And just to kind of illustrate um, what this means, so because the latency is so bad, um, you know, it just isn't fast for doing small operations, but the bandwidth of the big operations comes through. And to illustrate this, uh, the graph on the left, this is from one of our older machines actually, but the same general trend is true, true anywhere. If you're uh, writing data four kilobytes at a time, maybe you'll get 100 megabytes per second on this particular machine. If you're writing data a megabyte at a time, you're getting uh, you know, three, three or three and a half gig, uh, gigabytes per second. So that's a, you know, orders of magnitude difference in the kind of performance that you get just by writing data in bigger chunks at a time. And there's other similar uh, quirks. Um, this graph is on, uh, on Mira. We're showing what the performance is as you change the, uh, the access size. And it's not just, uh, this makes it look like a nice linear curve on this side because you know, you know, things are kind of gently sloping up. But if you try operations that aren't exactly aligned with power of two access sizes, performance can fluctuate quite a bit. Um, so these kind of optimizations, you know, so you, could, you can look at this and say, well, okay, I need to do big operations. I need to make sure they're aligned. Um, what you'll hear as the day goes on is that uh, we really don't want the application writer to do these things necessarily. It's about using tools that will do these things for you. Um, so that's what we're going to try and do is provide some things that will help so that you're not uh, working on your scientific code and thinking about byte alignment and things like that. We have pieces that can help you with it, but this is just to illustrate why it's important to use those uh, helper tools that can get you in this mode. Uh, the third thing, uh, what else is interesting about HPC IO? The applications themselves tend to have uh, complicated data models. Um, so, you know, a lot of scientific domains, you, you guys will know more about them than I will. They're using uh, multi-dimensional arrays. They may have complex types for what the variables are that are in those arrays. Uh, you may have images with different scan lines in them. There's going to be headers and attributes that tell you what sort of data it is, how it was generated, what were the input parameters. Um, so the, the, the data itself is, is pretty sophisticated. But then you look at what the parallel file system knows about, and it doesn't know about any of those things. Um, you have files, you have directories. Uh, the, the files just have bytes in them. So the trick is how to map from these uh, multi-dimensional arrays and other complicated data types into something that makes sense for the, the file system. And again, there's uh, tools that we'll be talking about today that help you with that. And just to give a quick example, um, Rob will be talking about uh, parallel net CDF later, but uh, this, this is an example of a, um, a layout from a particular uh, simulation that has uh, you know, temperature in a three-dimensional array, um, surface pressure in another array. And if you store this in NetCDF, you have a, a file format defined for you that has a header that tells you, you know, what is the type of those variables, 
how big are they, what are the dimensions, and then lays them out. And importantly, this, this does two things for you when you use a file format that kind of organizes it. Is, uh, you know, it's, it's self-describing, it's kind of portable. Someone 10 years from now can come back to a parallel net CDF file and say, oh, well, what are the variables in here they can find out. It's not um, kind of an uh, invented file format. And secondly, these things are organized in a way that's efficient for I.O. on these machines. Uh, the fourth thing um, is that uh, some of the things we'll talk about, the technologies are going to be a little different at each site. Uh, you know, the, the highest performance computers that we have are essentially custom built machines by a few different vendors. And their storage systems are no different. When it's time to buy a storage system for a machine, it's a, it's a complex process to design, figure out what, what needs to be there. Uh, there's different vendors, uh, IBM, and Intel, and Panassas, and Cray are some of the biggest ones that produce storage systems. And even once you've chosen a storage system, there may be different hardware behind it. Um, so the, the main thing here is that if you kind of hyper-tune uh, your application for one particular site, um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work great on another site. Um, the way to combat that is to uh, learn some debugging tools. We'll go through that this afternoon. And also to use, uh, use some standard libraries that work across these storage systems. And the last kind of uh, you know, concept on these file systems that I want to talk about is variability. Um, so why is there variability? You, know, you might think, um, I wrote, a, wrote this data one time, it took 30 seconds. If I write it again, it should take 30 seconds. That's generally not the case. Um, and there's a few reasons for this. One is that we have these large file systems, uh, like the project file system at the ALCF, and it doesn't just have one computer attached to it. It has a whole collection of machines that are using the storage. Um, so in this case, we have Mira, a BlueGene Q system. There's some smaller BlueGene systems, Cetus and Vesta attached to it. Uh, we have a, a Linux cluster, Cooley. Um, there's wide area file transfers, tape backups, all sorts of things that are sharing this one file system. So if someone on one of these other computers is really hammering it, you're going to feel it in your application on a different system. And not only that, but if you break it down to what's happening even in one of these systems, uh, just a couple days ago, I just logged in and looked at what jobs were running on, on Mira at that moment. And there's some that are 16,000 nodes, some 8,000 node jobs, 2,000 node jobs. Any of those could be accessing data at a given time, and it's going to make the performance kind of fluctuate because there's only uh, so much performance to go around. And so the, the takeaway here is that um, expect that the performance is going to vary. If you try to tune something a little bit, you run a job, it got one second faster, it might have just been one second faster anyway. So you need to take, um, take a few samples and just kind of keep in mind that things are going to fluctuate from run to run a little bit. So this is just to illustrate this. Um, this particular example, uh, we just took 15 runs within a day or two of each other of a particular I.O. benchmark on the Edison system. And each time we ran it, the time to complete the I.O. in this benchmark took as low as 50 seconds or as much as 65 seconds. So that's how much performance can swing depending on the system and what else is going on. Um, so if you, if you have the time, you know, if you're benchmarking, you can take a lot of samples. If you don't have the time to take samples when you're trying to tune something, then just be aware of it and don't read too much into kind of small, small changes in performance. So uh, just to recap the five things I wanted to run through here, um, you know, pick the right storage resource. There's multiple available at your site. Um, when you're moving data, try to do it in parallel. Use as many uh, resources at the same time as you can. Use libraries that will help with your data model if there's one available. And uh, chances are someone who will be uh, lecturing today can help you find those things. Uh, there's tools that are at your disposal for optimization. Um, some of them are not too hard to use, so we'll, uh, I hope anyway. So we'll review some easy ones that you can use to get a quick kind of view of what's going on. And then finally, keep in mind that sometimes performance is going to vary. Uh, you don't always have full control over your, your storage performance. So uh, kind of going back from those big principles to what does this look like on a, on a machine. Um, so I'll pick, uh, pick Mira as an example to talk about. So this is our uh, biggest computer at Argonne. Uh, it's not the newest, but it's the, the biggest one. Um, 
There's 48 racks, so you guys have probably heard all this already, but these are, these are the racks here. They've got a whole bunch of processors in them. Um, we've got 700,000 of them in total, 700 terabytes of memory. And each time we get one of these machines, uh, the kind of lead machine for a facility, it tends to be way, way faster than the one that it replaced. So this one uh, was 20 times faster, at least on paper, than the previous machine we had at Argonne. And what kind of storage system do we pair up with that to get feed data to it? Um, so the big, uh, I probably did this a little backwards, but the, the file system that's probably the kind of center point in it has uh, 16 big storage appliances. These are like big racks full of hard drives. Um, there's about 9,000 conventional hard drives, another 500 uh, solid state drives in it. And once it's all formatted with this, uh, you know, replication and redundancy and so forth. It has about 12 petabytes on it. Um, and that can get you uh, around you know, 200 gigabytes a second of performance if you use it um, kind of in an ideal way. That's just one of the file systems. There's more than one project file system there. Um, to hook it up to, to Mira itself, we have a 3,000 port uh, InfiniBand complex. So there's a pretty complicated network outside of the machine itself that gets you to the, the storage system and, and some other auxiliary parts. And you know, even though there's you know, 700,000 cores on Mira, they can't all talk to the storage. Um, that's just kind of intractable. So what they do is they relay uh, their I.O. operations to a, a few hundred uh, special nodes on the system. These are called the I.O. nodes that are the ones that are actually connected to the storage. So that's part of, this is part of your, your routing here to get from your application to the storage system. You go to an I.O. node. You go through the InfiniBand switch complex, you go to a server, you go through these storage appliances, and then you hit one of these 10,000 drives that's uh, back there. And this is a little kind of visual representation of the same thing. Um, you know, these are the big racks of compute nodes. These are the uh, I.O. nodes. This is our commodity network. This are our file servers. It's the storage controllers and our hard drives back here. Um, and there's a few more statistics there for you, but we just went, went through that. But this is sort of, uh, when we're dealing with a storage system this big and this complex, the software is all kind of geared towards trying to make good use of this. Um, now that's, that's sort of the hardware. Uh, in terms of the software, if you look at any computer system, you may kind of visualize it or conceptualize it as a stack like this. You have an application that has some, uh, some data and memory that it wants to use um, that it's performing calculations on. When you want to store it, you convert that into a, a format that's suitable for a hard drive, for, for a file. You write it into a file and it goes onto the hardware. You know, in reality, if you look at what the stack looks like on a machine like Mira, uh, there's a little bit more going on. Um, one thing we'll talk about today is uh, data model libraries like uh, HDF, NetCDF, and Adios that can help format data for you and kind of get it into a nice, nice layout and use the storage system effectively. Um, there tends to be a transformation layer that'll take data from those libraries and kind of convert it into a nice um, you know, optimal kind of organization of data for the file system. That's usually MPIIO. Uh, there's software running on the IO nodes. Um, on Mira, it's IBM CIOD. On uh, other systems, it may be something different, but that's the software that relays data from the compute nodes to the storage system. And then finally, the storage system itself has software running on it. That's the, the file system. So that's, that's complicated. There's a lot of pieces here. There's a lot of software. But really, all you need to know are these top level things. If you find a data model that suits you, um, a library that suits you, it's going to, all the other stuff just happens. The, the reason I'm, I'm telling you all this stuff is not to teach you things that you need to go and uh, program for and, and do a lot of things with, but it's to kind of give some understanding of why it's important to um, kind of use things as best you can so it can organize uh, what's going on on these systems. And just to give an example of, of why this might change from system to system, if we compare it to Theta, that's another machine that we have at Argonne, a uh, newer machine. Uh, the parallel file system is totally different. It's a Lustre parallel file system. Um, the I.O. forwarding is totally different. Um, instead of having uh, I.O. forwarding nodes, it really has what's called LNAT routers that just kind of route network traffic. I.O. hardware is totally different. It's provided by a different vendor. Um, has different types of hard drives in it. 
So all these things are different. Um, and that means that the optimizations have to be a little bit different. But again, if you stick to the, uh, the top level libraries, those haven't changed. Um, and they're tuned per system to try and do the right thing. So if you stick with uh, kind of a good top level organization, then the idea, it's not always perfect, but the idea is that it will adapt to the system you're on. So when acquiring these systems, does the I.O. system um, kind of come as just a package deal with the vendor because it's switching to the Intel cluster, or is it an independent consideration? Well, it varies from place to place, but uh, usually it's acquired separately, a separate contract. Um, so it depends on the side. Like Oak Ridge, for example, likes to have a storage system that transcends the compute systems they're attaching to it. So it's actually even a, a very large procurement, and they totally decouple it from the machines. Um, Theta, in this case, we got a storage system with it that's kind of matched to what, what Gray markets, so it, it varies, but usually separate. There's some I know some Mira, right? And uh, I know that the PIIO has some uh, optimizations like two-phase IO and so on, which is basically to collect some, some of your processes. So when you refer to these I know these are independent of your uh, application, so it's basically all the applications are basically like transferring to these I know. Right. Is it? Right. So it, it, and this is another thing that kind of varies across systems. On on Mira, you have a fixed set of I O nodes for your application. You're the only person that has those I O nodes. On uh, Theta, I O nodes are shared. It's a little more dynamic in terms of how many I O nodes you might be going through, but. Uh, generally, you don't get to control this. Just however big your job is tends to have more, more of these resources. Yeah. And then uh, kind of looking forward to the future a little bit. Um, you know, what are, what are things going to look like uh, 10 years from now? Uh, who knows? We may have object storage systems. Uh, Non-volatile memory is, is already in the pipe. If you look at the next machines for Argonne and Oak Ridge and so forth, they say it there on the web page we'll have it. Um, Probably going to be different file systems, uh, maybe the same vendors, but they may be developing new stuff. You never know. Um, but the the constant in all this is still these data model libraries. Um, these are all very active projects, uh, long running, and they will adapt uh, to match what comes under it. So um, we'll get into more detail about how they're doing that later. So that's sort of the kind of high level, not, not too machine specific um, concepts of what's in these storage systems and what you might want to do about it. Mm -hmm.